Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you probably know, we are studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series of lessons is for April, May, and June of 2014. And this series is entitled Christ and His Law. And this particular lesson is lesson number 11 in that series. It's entitled The Apostles and the Law. What do you suppose apostles had to do with the law? They didn't make any laws, did they? So what did the apostles have to do with the law? That will be the, the focus of what we want to talk about in our lesson today. Uh, but as you know, we, there's two things we always like to start with. We like to encourage you to get your Bible and have it ready because we're going to use a lot of Bible verses. And then we would like to encourage you to bow your heads with us as we begin with a word of prayer. Our loving Father, as we look back some 2,000 years to the time when you were here on this earth and to your faithful followers who turned the world upside down in one generation, what was their attitude toward the law? Did they change it in somehow, some way? Did they follow your example? What did you do with the law? We've talked about that. Help us to clearly understand the attitude you want us to take toward the law and your covenants from the beginning to the end is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Is there any evidence in Scripture <coughs> that the Ten Commandments were done away with during the apostolic age? No. No. Well, we can finish our lesson. That was done, right? <laughs> Got the answer in one, one word, well, right? Why is that, well, that question yeah. important? It seems like it's always important. You gotta, is, is somebody, say, somebody saying it's done away with, right? Yes. And let's, let's be honest. I think it's fair enough for us to be honest. We Seventh-day Adventists have focused on a couple of verses in the book of Revelation as our special claim to fame, if you will. And let's look at those two verses. The first one is found in Revelation 12:17. It says, the dragon was furious with the woman, and the woman representing the church here, and went off to fight against the rest of her descendants. Those are the ones, the King James says, the remnant, or that's one of the way interpretations is. All those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to the truth revealed by Jesus, my version says. So we say, based on that, what are going to be the characteristics of God's faithful people at the end? God's faithful church, what's, what do we know about them? They're going to keep all the commandments but one. Mm -hmm. huh? <laughs> okay. Maybe Is all it, the commandments. Oh, or they're going, to, they're going to change one of them. Are we talking about Jesus' commandments or are we talking about something else? Yeah, those new commandments. Covenants no. we talked about last week. Well, the way we have traditionally understood that is that we, we believe it applies <coughs> to the Ten Commandments. God gave, and we believe that that means that the people who are going to be saved is God's final group of people are going to be faithful observers of all Ten Commandments, including the Sabbath commandment. Look at Revelation 14, 12. Put it alongside Revelation 12, 17. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Okay? And of course, we've, we usually go on to, to add... Revelation 1912 I don't know what I mean 1910 I don't know if we should mention that right now but maybe we should in light of the fact that these have become famous verses for the Adventist church Revelation 19 says 10 says then I fell down at his feet to worship him but he said to me you must not do that I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy and how do we interpret that we believe that because we have the revealed writings of Ellen White, which we call the spirit of prophecy, then because we keep all the Ten Commandments and because we have the writings of Ellen White, we are the remnant church. Right? First of all, um, God gave more than Ten Commandments, didn't he? And uh, on Mount Sinai, the famous ones, there are ten. So it's just referring to those ten. Mm -hmm. And um, the spirit of prophecy. Well, that's the, that's the, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you again. That's the way it has been interpreted. 
I mean, the commandments of God, if you look in the (laughs) Bible, I think if we just keep, there there seems to be, yeah. And then the spirit of prophecy, could that be uh, Daniel, Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, and, and all of them? All of that's fine, but, but look, remember what we just read. We're talking about, specifically talking about a group of people living at the very end of this earth's history. So that sort of rules out Jeremiah and Isaiah, doesn't it? So well, we're the spirit of prophecy, you can say it's, you can make an argument it's been here ever since, who knows oh, when. I'm no argument with that. Yeah. The question is, how does it apply to the people who are living at the very end of this world's history? Because that spirit of prophecy the, is still with them. Yeah, the, the, sure, I, yeah. But how, how do they manifest that spirit of prophecy? How are they, are they keeping the Ten Commandments? Are they observing all the commands that God gave? That, that's the question. The spirit of prophecy is so the people in the last days can interpret the whole Bible and what is happening in Revelation to the uh, current, uh, to, to give the three angels message. They have to understand all the prophecy. Of course, you, you, you mentioned Ellen White as if that's the only manifestation of the spirit of prophecy. That wasn't my intention. But oh, okay. Well, good. Because I was going to say, you know, Joel mentions that, um, you know, your old men will dream dreams and, and young men will prophesy and so forth. So. Well, now let's, let's get to the, down here where the rubber meets the road. Why is it that so many of our Christian friends believe that the keeping of the Ten Commandments is no longer necessary? Not under the law, we're under grace. What, what are they specifically objecting to? Well, notice this is, this is our introduction to our lesson in our Bible study guide, adult Bible, teacher's Bible study guide, I mean adult Bible study guide for Sabbath, June 7. First, some, as we have seen, look at certain New Testament texts that condemn a false understanding of the law's function, but conclude that the problem is with the law itself. As a result, they claim that the Ten Commandments are not obligatory for those under the New Covenant. Okay? That's one of the things. Secondly, others are so convinced that the Sabbath is not binding on Christians that in order to justify this position, they claim that all the commandments have been crucified with Christ, with Jesus, on the cross. That's another possibility. Third, some argue that the other nine commandments are in effect, but that the fourth, the seventh-day Sabbath, has been superseded by Sunday, which is kept in honor of the resurrection of Jesus. So are we saying that you have to keep Sabbath or seventh-day Sabbath or you won't be saved? You just said it. I didn't. No, I was asking you <laughs> if that's what you were saying by reading all of that. That would be the implication. Well, that, that, that would be, would be the... the... So uh, we had some people in our history that even was written by written about by Ellen White, they didn't keep the Sabbath. You got Wesley, you got, sure. you got Luther, you got but once again, even William Miller never kept the Sabbath. Right. But once again, remember, hold on, remember, we're talking about the people who are going to be living at the very end. What applies to them? Okay, so why should that change if God doesn't change? As Wait, far as, as, far as people being saved. This, this, is, uh, this is not going to make sense to people until it's commanded that you will keep the Sabbath. And then the people will have to think, what is the Sabbath? And that's when people are going to start realizing uh, and, uh, that their arguments are falling short. So the sooner we help along these Sunday laws, why the better off we'll be. No. Question. The quicker things will come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Question. Saturday doesn't fall on the exact same day everywhere in the world. Let's say if I'm here, Saturday might be Sunday in Japan, for, for instance. Mm-hmm. So why is it? And exactly what do you mean when you say, for someone who's listening, we know, but what do you mean when you say observe the Sabbath? Does this just mean that I get up, I, I get dressed, and I go in a building that day, I listen, and I get back out? You mean observe the Sabbath? Mm-hmm. That's your question. Yeah, what that is too. Is that, and th- does that mean you go to church when you observe it, or is that how you observe it? 
Okay. Because no. some people just think getting up, going in a building on Saturday and go home, going home is observing. That makes us so special. You do it on Saturday it's instead of some other day. One or two basic reasons. In the time of crisis, certainly much earlier, people didn't move at the speed we do. No. Uh, so they, there may have been a few that realized there were some changes, but when you've got a world that we can literally fly around in hours, there's a difference, and we had to draw a line. Yeah. Okay, so let, let's, let's be honest with the scriptures now. Look at some verses. What do we say about Romans 3.28? I'm going to give you four or five verses here. What do we do with verses like Romans 3.28? For we conclude that a person is put right with God only through faith and not by doing what the law commands. Doesn't that sound like we just took care of the law? Yes. And what about Romans 6.14? Sin must not be your master, for you do not live under law, but under God's grace. But that sounds pretty like clear. You've got to get the overall picture. Okay, hold on. Let's read a couple more verses. Look at Romans 7.4. That is how it is with you, my sisters and brothers. As far as the law is concerned, you also have died because you are part of the body of Christ and now you belong to him who was raised from death in order that we might be useful in the service of God. Law doesn't apply to us anymore, right? You're talking about the Ten Commandment law or, or no, all, that, all, that, all that Old Testament stuff? Decide that for yourself. Look at Romans 10, 4. For Christ has brought the law to an end so that everyone who believes is put right with God. Isn't that, I mean, how much clearer do you need it to be? That is very, very clear. Well, but and look at Galatians 3, 24 and 25. And so the, the law was in charge of us until Christ came, in order that we might then be put right with God through faith. Now that the time for faith is here, the law is no longer in charge of us. I mean, that it, this discussion should be all over with by then, right? No. Once saved, always saved. And they do have verses, too. Mm -hmm. Paul, but Paul discusses this elsewhere in, along the lines of a lawyer, which he may well have been trained to be somewhere, and he makes it very explicit. The law is still there. Okay, well, well let, let's, let's go back. What, what is it, what's what he's talking about here, once again, similar to what we discussed last week, and that is... Um, you're not saved by keeping all that law. Yeah. What does the keeping of law do for you? Well, everything we discussed last week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, let's not go there then. We did that last week. <laughs> but look, l let's go back to those exact same contexts and look what Paul said in the same context exactly. Now we're going to go four, three verses later, Romans 3.31. Does this mean that by this faith we do away with the law? Not, no, not at all. Instead, we uphold the law. How does that sound? Confusing. That sounds like it's completely in contradiction over verse 28, right? And then we read 614, Romans 614, but look at 615. What then shall we say because we are not under law but under God's grace? By no means. This is not, a, this is not an excuse to sin. I'm going to pick those two, those two verses to prove my point. Okay, and now look at Romans 7, 7 to 12. Shall we say then that the law itself is sinful? Of course not. But it was the law that made me know what sin is. If the law had not said, do not desire what belongs to someone else, I would not have known such a desire. But by means of that commandment, sin found its chance to stir up all kinds of selfish desires <clears throat> in me. Apart from the law, sin is a dead thing. I myself was once alive apart from law. But when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. And the commandment which was meant to bring life, in my case, brought death. Sin found its chance, and by means of the commandment, it deceived me and killed me. So then the law itself is holy, and the commandment is holy, right, and good. Does that sound like a good thing? Yeah. I mean, these are all like direct contradictions to what we read just a few moments ago, and verses that are right next to them. You know, I uh, go to this uh, Baptist church during the week, and this is what drives me nuts, <laughs> is they give one verse, and then they say, okay, this is it. And I've decided I've got to bring my iPad or Bible, 
because I'm used to reading what goes before and what goes after. Yep. And they <laughs> never show, they just show one verse or they'll show a half a verse, dot, 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 and the rest. And, and so I like how you're doing it. You can read before and you can read after. Mm -hmm. Well, here's Galatians 3.21. We've, we've compared every one of those other verses. Look at Galatians 3. Does this mean that the law is against God's promises? No, not at all. For if human beings had received a law that could bring life, then everyone could be put right with God by obeying it. So that is saying we cannot even be put right even if we obey it. Yeah. So what is the proper relationship between grace and law? You can all spell that out in one sentence, right? I think they're both intact and together work. Mm -hmm. Ask that question again. What is the proper relationship between grace and law? Don't we have to find the relationship between law and sin first to get to that to well, the grace part? Well, Paul no. just told us there in Romans yeah. 7 that the law points out sin, very yes. clearly points out yeah. sin. So at least that's a one hint. Yeah. You know, I, I, <clears throat> if I come up to you and say, I abolish showering, I don't shower anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I don't do it. I don't even take a bath anymore. Okay. <laughs> okay, you know why? Because I spend my time now diving for gold nuggets out of, on a freshwater lake somewhere. So now I, I'm doing that. And it's taking care of the shower and the baths. Okay. So if you if you um, accept Jesus Christ, isn't that kind of like doing the same thing? When you accept Him, you're actually accepting the law because He is a living example of the law. Okay. Let's let's think about this for a moment. When God took the trouble of speaking to the children of Israel on Mount Sinai and writing down the Ten Commandments with his own finger on tables of stone, did he intend for those directions to be ignored? No. No. Why did he give those directions? Well, what do you mean by directions? Well, I'm... I'm uh, isn't, it, isn't it kind of showing you what God is? What is the right way to go? Sure. It's, but it's, it's. I don't know if you want to call it directions right there. Would well, you? but oh, don't let, let, steal let, is kind of a direction. Don't steal. Well, don't commit know, adultery. If, don't it, kill. Don't kill. Don't. If you have somebody you admire that doesn't do those sure. things, are you not going to um, take on the inspiration exactly. not to do them? And that's exactly the point. See, if you if you look at the law. The Ten Commandments that say, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this kind of thing, then That's it's good. a problem. <laughs> See? If, on the other hand, you say, I now understand why God gave me these Ten Commandments, these guidelines, whatever you want to call them. I understand why. It's actually from, I think it's a good idea to have all my neighbors not wanting to kill me. When you understand, you've learned, you've yes. learned that lesson. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is all about teaching. I'm going to take a radical view uh, in response to your question, the relationship between grace and okay. law. I'm surprised. Um, we, have, we talk about grace a lot and that it has power to handle the problem of sin after we've committed the sin. I have committed the sin and now uh, I can go to God and He can forgive that sin so that it no longer, death no longer has it's a rain over me. Okay. But that seems to, but, 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 but that's where we stop. Um, God has power over sin in my life after I've committed the sin, not before I've committed the sin. I, so, hope, and, I hope that's not true or we're in trouble. <laughs> well, that, that's often so. I'm going to, well, I'm glad you said that because that supports my theory so that <clears throat> we have grace which can help us solve the, solve the problem of sin after I've committed it. Mm -hmm. And you can't go back and f fix that. But now I have my life before me, and I have grace. And so when I come up before temptation, God can help me keep me from falling into temptation. Therefore, I can live a perfect life from now on. Well, mm -hmm. I I have you been able to do that? No. Um, Be honest. Well, now let's <laughs> got, get personal here. <laughs> We're talking about theology here. Right. What, okay. what isn't, I mean, isn't that... Really, isn't that the way we often deal with grace? It's, okay. well, it's a sin in the past, no problem. 
But then when it talks about controlling sins of the future, well, you never hear any sermons on that. And that's a very big problem because <laughs> clearly the scriptures, if you read the fine print, <clears throat> suggest that it's not what's in the past because not even God himself can do anything about what happened in the past. God is concerned about your future behavior. Grace is talking about a gracious God who is loving and kind and considerate. And if we come to know him, it will change the way we behave. And that's our future behavior. And I won't sin anymore. Well, ultimately, yes. <laughs> well, when is, when is ultimate? I've, I've got the grace now. When is that ultimate? Never mind. Let's get on with the lesson. <laughs> there's, there's a verse, Oh, wretched man that I am. Romans. What I want to do, I don't do. What I don't want to do, I do. Well, Roman, the end of Romans 7, 24. And that, that was a man under grace. Yeah. But so are we ever going to walk around as image of perfection? Well, then what good is this? What, it, doesn't I it don't kind think of, we ever will, because to do that, you'd be God, wouldn't you? Well, doesn't that, well, okay. I'm supposed to be like him. Be like him, but not God himself. Let's, let's, let, let's go back to our study and see what we can learn from the <laughs> apostles about the importance of the law and how we should keep it. Look at Acts 10, verses 9 to 14. Uh, I'm not going to go all the, read the whole thing. This is the story of Peter. He's in Joppa. He has this vision, and the, 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 the sheet comes down with all these inedible things in it. And what does Peter say? I will never no. eat it. So if, you, if Peter felt that way about his Jewish traditions that he grew up with, would he, would he readily accept the idea that we do away with the Ten Commandments? No. Doesn't sound like it, does it? Well, wasn't the point of that that he was supposed to change his mind on some things? Well, of course so he did. So I don't know if that, that illustration <laughs> worked very well, if you ask me. Well, well, it wasn't God's commandment that the Jews not have anything to do with the Gentiles. That was a no. Jewish tradition. Yeah, but I'm talking about Peter. He didn't want to eat those things. Right? When God says that what God's made clean, they're clean. So, but, but he still did, didn't want to eat them. But what did God mean? What did the angel mean by, and Peter mean by that? No, but you're both <coughs> missing the point the lesson is trying to say. Okay. <laughs> what the lesson is trying to say Peter still felt very concerned about even the kosher laws. Mm -hmm. Isn't that pretty clear from this vision? Yes. We're not going to talk about what the result was down the line. The point was, at this point in time, in Peter's life, he said, I still abide by these kosher laws, Lord. I'm not going to eat the stuff you gave me in the sheet. If he felt that way about the kosher laws, how would he feel about the Ten Commandments? Oh, that's what they're still binding. Counting that's from that's Israelites way back. Exactly. But still, underneath that, God was trying to change his mind. And so. Well, about some other you, things. Which yeah, are, I know, but um, somebody's going to think that when they, when they look, listen to that illustration. Because we're talking about not changing the law, but yet God was trying to change Peter's of, mind here. There's a lot of people who intentionally try to misread that passage and say this is to say the kosher laws are out the window we can eat whatever we want from now on that's not what God was trying to teach us you know, all the early church people Peter John James all pro Lord very definitely yeah well look at John look at the gospel of John now look at John 15 and let's look at verse 10 if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. My love. This is Jesus speaking it, you know, on, on the, his last night with the disciples. Just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. Now, presumably, John was re accurately reporting what Jesus actually said. Do we believe that? We do not consider Jesus a legalist. And yet he's, and look at what John wrote about all that many years later, 60, 70 years later. If we obey, this is 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 to 6. If we obey God's commands, then we are sure that we know him. Those who say that they know him but do not obey his commands, 
commands are liars and there is no truth in them. He's pretty clear about that, I would say. Mm -hmm. All those who obey his word are people who, whose love for God has really been made perfect. This is how we can be sure that we are union with, in union with God. Those who say that they remain in union with God should live just as Jesus Christ did. Jay, that's the goal right there. It's spelled out for you. And you can do it with grace every mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. So, um, and if you want to compare Paul... Harry is shaking his head over there. Quietly. <laughs> <laughs> <Well, I, laughs> quietly. Uh, and we should be, read the, the, the prototypical laws, I mean, verses about this. Look at Romans 13, 8 and 10. Be under obligation to no one. The only obligation you have is to love one another. Whoever does this has obeyed the law. And verse 10, um, you know, I forgot where verse 10 starts. Oh, if you love someone, you will never do them wrong. To love, then, is to obey the whole law. Do we believe that? Yes. Okay, look at these words from Ellen White. How do we understand this? The law of God requires that we love our fellow men as we love ourselves. Then every power and action of the mind must be put forth to that end, to do the greatest amount of good. How pleasing to the giver for man to hold the royal gifts of the soul so that they shall tell with power upon others. A lot of little bit of dark speech there. We are supposed to accept God's love into our lives so we can do what? Give it to others. They are the connecting link between God and man and reveal the spirit of Christ and the attributes of heaven. The power of holiness, seen but not boasted of, you're not supposed to boast about your holiness, Jay, speaks more eloquently than the most able sermons. It speaks of God and opens to men their duty more powerfully than mere words can do. Manuscript releases, that's an interesting place. Manuscript releases from Ellen White, volume 20, page 138. So what is she saying there? <laughs> I mean, it sounds like it sounds like um, there's a lot of direction that we have to do. And, and, and really, you can look at that and say, well, this is what happens when the Lord comes in you. Mm -hmm. uh, all this stuff is, all these requirements are taken <coughs> care of. She is saying that the love is the fulfillment of the law. Right. When we receive the love of God into our lives, okay. then that love is supposed to be shown by us out to others. And if it doesn't get shown to others, that means he hasn't come in. Well, yeah, it means we're not doing what he wants us to do, at least. Well, you know, as an example, there's um, many older, older Adventists that I see at Potluck and other places who just have this kindness just coming out of their eyes, their pores, mm -hmm. their mouth, that whatever they say, you can just uh, see love, care, and kindness. And to me that even though they have wrinkled faces and gray hair and stuff, <laughs> and you compare that to what we saw with the Academy Awards, the people going down the red carpet with the plastic surgeries and um, where you couldn't even recognize the people. You know, what is lovelier to look at? An older person that has love just coming out of their body, even though their body is uh, older, or these people that are uh, going down the red carpet, for a, you see no love in their eyes. And, and I think... Well, they have love for themselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But when I see a verse like that, it, it, it makes me think, you know, what is valuable in this world? And I would rather be uh, next in talking to a person that is, um, has not undergone plastic surgery to, yeah. if that makes so sense. So if anybody has walked down that carpet and is watching this show, don't listen to us, listen to God, <laughs> because he's more forgiven than we are, I guess. I experienced something sim similar to what you're saying. It, I was going through a period, I thought, oh, Adventists are just, you know, the whole thing, oh, hypocrites, they don't do what they preach and what have you. 
And there's this lady, and I, they won't mind if I say her name, called Mrs. Josiah. And we had been in a Bible class together. I've known her for a while, and I heard that she had cancer, and she was in the hospice there. I took my son with me to go see her. And that woman was in terrible pain, and she called my son over. And she was pushing herself up and hold my son's name to bless him. I, I talk about that night, but it, and it, that's the way she's always been. She Care was, for oh others. my God. Uh -huh. All her, uh, that's all she always did. She would try to see who was then come to church and try to call them and pray with you. And I was going through a terrible uh, time with my daughter. She would call and pray with me. And, and, and it just renewed my. F yes. And, and every renewed. once in a while, God put those th things in your life to just renew you. And, and that can. happened to me again not too long ago. Because uh, mm -hmm. you've seen a lot of the other type. Yeah, but, but every once in a while, you see the, yes. Yeah, right, genuine Jesus himself taught, and hopefully Seventh-day Adventists have consistently taught, that mm -hmm. the Ten Commandments are summarized in love to God and love to our fellow beings. We've heard that many times. Let's hope it's actually shown in our lives. The very essence of God's government is love. By contrast, let's be very clear about this, the very <coughs> essence of Satan's government is selfishness. Now, let's think about that. Which kind of government would you prefer to live in? God. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, not all of the apostles were disciples. The book of James was almost certainly written by the older stepbrother of Jesus. Earlier in his ministry, Jesus was approached by his brothers who, because they were older and thought that they had authority over him, tried to tell him what to do. And what did Jesus do? He rejected their discussion, their suggestions. May you explain that? Not all apostles are disciples? Yes. Apostle is someone that knew Jesus. The, the disciples were the ones... We, we usually use the term disciple to refer to the twelve who are following Jesus through his ministry. Okay. The apostles are those who went out later. Those are sent out oh, okay. to, 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 to carry the gospel around the world. And that included a lot of people. For example, the, the prototypical person of that group would be Paul. He was not a disciple, but he was certainly an apostle. Okay, thank you. Okay? Thank you. So if you want to read about Jesus' early relationship to his brothers, look at John 7, 1 to 9, where they try to tell him what to do. The interesting thing is that after his resurrection, his death and his resurrection, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers became his fervent followers, along with the rest of the, with the disciples. You read about that in Acts 1, verse 14. James, who was apparently the oldest stepbrother of Jesus, and let's just, let's just look at that verse real quick. Matthew 13, verse 55. When Jesus went back to Nazareth, what did they say about him? Isn't he the carpenter's son? Isn't Mary his mother? And aren't James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas his brothers? Aren't all his sisters living here? By the way, how many sisters of Jesus do you know? None. <laughs> we know nothing about any of them. Where did he get all this? And so they rejected him. Absolutely incredible. Well, they, they didn't think God would be like. So Jesus came being. from a big family of a lot of children. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> but later, James and Judas, presumably Judah, uh, we, we in the New Testament we call him Jude, ro rose to prominent positions in the church. <coughs> um, Read Acts 15, verse 13, and Galatians 1, 19. But in his short book, James focused on the challenges of establishing new congregations and getting them to love each other. And who would be in one of those new Christian congregations? Jews. A variety of Jews who formerly couldn't get along with each other. And who else? Maybe even some Gentiles. And here, you got a group of people who never saw eye to eye on anything and all of a sudden you put them in a church and say love one another. <laughs> Do you mean the Christian church had Pharisees, scribes, and Gentiles together? That's exactly what I mean. Just like it had saints and sinners together. <laughs> Except no saints. Fishermen and shepherds. And, yeah. and it would have been okay so. if everybody would eat the same. I mean, some of these, <laughs> what these other people eat over there, <laughs> you know. Is that like today we have liberals and conservatives and progressives and 
traditionalists altogether? Yes, I like that. Yeah. Well, many Christians believe that Paul's emphasis on faith and grace is in contradiction to James's emphasis on good deeds. Is it or isn't it? Yeah. Well, let's look at some work, some gave, text. Gave Luther some problems. Yeah, it did. Look at James 2.26. So then, as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without actions is dead. Does he think works are important? Well, contrast Paul in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For it is by God's grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not the result of your own efforts, but God's gift so that no one can boast about it. Isn't that pretty clearly in opposition to James? If you if you have if you have if you have faith, then works are a natural byproduct of that faith. Huh. In other words, like one of my friends said, <coughs> faith works. Could be. Are your works a litmus of your faith? Perhaps. What they don't observe all these people who want to draw this clear distinction between Paul and James is the little verse found in Romans 2 verse 13 which says for it is not by this is Paul now for it is not by hearing the law that people are put right with God but by doing what the law commands oh dear now Paul is sounding like James well there are some times when I know that I should do things which are right, but I don't want to do them. Oh dear, where did the want come into? And by George, I'm going to make myself do it, and eventually I'll get to where I like doing the right thing. So if I force myself to do this long enough, I'll do what? You get to where you, you like doing the right thing. Yeah, that's what I thought about. Um, some people think about when they marry somebody. The guy's a jerk, but maybe, you know, I'll make him do the right thing, and after a while, he'll be perfect. Well, you know, when we talk about marriage, I will say, because I have a number of friends from Asia that are often, at least in the past, had their marriages arranged. Mm -hmm. They would say it like this. He says, you Americans, you take a, a dish that's boiling hot and you put it on a cold stove and it gradually gets colder. We take a cold pot and put it on a hot stove and it warms up. There you go. I'm not sure that makes any sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's leave that subject. There are successes and failures both ways. Yes. <laughs> so let's be honest now let's get down to where the rubber meets the road there are, there are reasons why people want to immigrate to this country yes <laughs> so who is behind the effort to set aside god's laws Satan. we need to be careful how we state this especially to our christian friends there is no doubt that satan is the author of that movement james and paul were trying to get us to avoid two extremes and what are the extremes one extreme is that we can somehow be saved by keeping the law. And the other extreme is the law, the law is no longer in effect. So do we need to avoid both of those extremes? It, the other one, it doesn't make sense. You cannot say it's okay to kill and rob people and do all this. It doesn't make sense. I spoke with an, an Adventist who told me that, who told me, you know, everything... Jesus nailed this and that and whatever. And then when I asked him, are you saying you should do this and that? Then he said, no, 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 I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that when you sin, you can rely on the blood. Like, uh, what's his name, Jimmy Swagger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. On the blood. He did. Well, I'm going to say, I'm going to put my foot down and say, there is no evidence from Scripture that the early apostles or disciples were promoting or even condoning a setting aside of God's law. Might Matthew they Fon might they be shocked now at even the conversation of such? Mm -hmm. What were you going to say, Jim? Matthew five seventeen yeah. and so forth. Think not I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Truly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever relaxes then 
excuse me, whoever then relaxes one of the least of these, or in other words, sets aside one of the least of these commandments, shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Well, this lesson should have taught us, we read contrasting verses that are almost right next to each other in the Bible. It should have taught us the importance of taking the full context into consideration when trying to interpret a single verse. In other words, or to be more honest, what would we like to say here? We would like to say when interpreting the Bible, we need to take into how big a context? The whole Bible. The whole great controversy. We want to, we want to interpret every verse in the Bible in light of the entire context of the great controversy. Well, in the days of the Cold War, let me illustrate. In the days of the Cold War, the United States spent millions of dollars trying to develop a computer system. Now, remember, computers were pretty primitive in those days that could translate Russian into English. I mean, think of how much trouble we would save if we could just get all, stuff all those Russian documents into a computer and they out comes the other end, the English which we need to... You, we mean, can, you mean English into Russian or Russian? You said Russian well, into English. Both ways, okay. Russian and English especially. The computer, of course, took a very literal approach to the translation of the language without considering the context. Well, you know, it's, it's dealing with more or less one word at a time. At one point, someone put into the computer the English expression taken from Jesus' statement to the sleeping disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know the statement, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Remember, that's what Jesus said to the disciples. Matthew 26, 41, Mark 14, 38. The Russian expression that came out said, in essence, the wine is okay, but the meat has gone bad. <laughs> <laughs> you can see that it's pretty important to have the context to understand what we're talking about, right? Surely this brief example should encourage us to take the largest possible context in trying to interpret scriptures. Seventh-day Adventists should read each portion of scripture in the full light of the great controversy and our understanding of the plan of salvation. Okay, having said that, the early church had some major issues. Now let's see how they actually applied what we've been talking about. The early church had some major issues that needed to be resolved. The first one is found in Acts 6. Let's just look at that real quick. Sometime later, as the number of disciples kept growing, there was a quarrel between the Greek-speaking Jews and the native Jews. The Greek-speaking Jews claimed that their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of funds or food. So the twelve apostles called the whole group of believers together and said, What? It's not right for us to neglect the preaching of God's word in order to handle finances. So then, brothers and sisters, choose seven men among you who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and we will put them in charge of this matter. What were they supposed to be in charge of? Church finances. finances. Making sure that there's a fair distribution of the goods, right? We ourselves then will give our full time to prayer and to the word work of preaching. The whole group was pleased with the apostles' proposal, so they chose Stephen. Now notice these names and see if you see any pattern here. We chose, they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a Gentile from Antioch who had earlier been converted to Judaism. Do those names say anything to you? Wow, well, nothing. Names of you know, mixed nations, aren't they? These are either Greek or Latin names. There's not one of them that's a Hebrew name. So they went almost, they bent all over, almost all over backwards to make sure that the Greek speaking Jews were represented, right? The Greek speaking Christians. So what resulted, and we know. Philip went out and Stephen went out and they were probably just as good a preachers as, as the disciples were, right? So that was a win-win solution, right? <coughs> well, let's take another one. Now, this gets a little more complicated. Look at Acts 15. Some men came from Judea to Antioch and started teaching the believers, you cannot be saved unless you are circumcised as the law of Moses requires. Paul and Barnabas got into a fierce argument with them about this. I mean, does that sound like the right thing to be doing in church? So it was decided that Paul and Barnabas and some of the others in Antioch should go to Jerusalem and see the apostles and elders about this matter. 
Well, we don't have time to read the whole thing, but they had what we sometimes call the first general conference. And what was the conclusion at the end of that general conference? Acts 15, isn't it? Well, it's interesting that, yeah, Acts 15, in verse 19, someone seems to give the, the, the presiding opinion. It is my opinion, James went on, by the way, this is not James who is the brother of John because he's already been killed by Herod. So this is James who's the brother of Jesus. James went on that we should not trouble the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write a letter telling him not to eat any food that is ritually unclean because it has been offered to idols to keep themselves from sexual immorality and not to eat any animal that has been strangled or any blood. For the law of Moses has been read for a long, very long time in the synagogue every Sabbath, and his words are preached in every town. So, so is that how they're saved? Well, that's what I was going to ask you. What was that all about? I asked you before you asked us. <laughs> <laughs> are those, is, is, <laughs> when you joined the church, did that, they tell you that's what you have to do in order to be saved? No. No. What were those four commands? What was the purpose of those four things? Sure makes the Jewish people more comfortable. Okay. Those are four rules that were so obnoxious to Jews that the Jews just said, please, you Gentiles, if you want to come and worship with us in this congregation and sit beside us in church, please at least follow these rules. We don't want to gag. <laughs> we don't want to gag. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, that was fair. I mean, that's, that was a reasonable conclusion, right? Well, even in the home, you do some things to keep peace in the yeah. family. Well, think what would happen. Paul and Barnabas have just come back from their first missionary journey. And what did they do on their first missionary journey? Where did they go? What, what was their job? Um, spreading the gospel to non-Jewish territories. Exactly. They were out there baptizing Gentiles, weren't they? and setting up churches primarily in Gentile. Now, there were Jews in all those churches, but there were a lot of Gentiles. And what was it that the Jews were worried about? The Jews said, these people have to become Jews first, and then they can become Christians. They have to go through all the ceremonies, all the rituals, as Jews do, and then they can become Christians. Why did they want to, be like, why did they want to say that? Because that's the way they were. Yes. In other words, yeah. they were afraid that people who are not like us are going to become a majority in our church. What are we going to do if people who don't think exactly like us become a majority in our church? So you think they did that to thin them out? That's exactly what they wanted. They wanted, they wanted to keep those Gentiles out of it. Well, they said, okay, it's all right if you, if you become a Christian providing you go through all the Jewish ceremonies first. So if you want to become really like us, then you can be a Christian. Then you can become a, like us, and then we won't... Uh, yeah. Then you'll be one of us, so, so you'll be part of the majority. Yeah. Well, doesn't that kind of just kind of boost their value a little bit as long, yeah. if, they, if they performed all that stuff before they became Christians, you know, that, that the Jewish... I mean, I, the people that had the Jewish background thought themselves more valuable yeah. then. Oh, was, absolutely. Was that really wrong because that would train the people in what the sanctuary meant and all the history and it would make more understanding Christians or? Well, what Paul specifically was talking about is we are not going to make every Gentile who decides to become a Christian to, to be circumcised. We're not going to require that. See, it would have been too big a thing, and there's no connection at that point in time between being circumcised and being saved. And I would have loved to have been there. I wish I had a recording. Uh, because what we really have here, look at Acts 2 verses, in, uh, Acts 15 verse 2 and then verse 5. Paul and Barnabas got into this fierce argument, we already read that, with them about this. So it was decided that Paul and Barnabas and some of the others in Antioch should go to Jerusalem and see the apostles and elders about this matter. So one side, who are the, who are the champions of one side? Paul and Barnabas, right? 
What was Paul's background? The Pharisees going home to his home turf. Well, look at verse 5. Who is he arguing against? But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said that Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. Here we have one Pharisee or a couple of Pharisees, I'm not sure how many Pharisees, in hot argument with other Pharisees. And they're all claiming to be Christians. That would have been some discussion. Well, if somebody had to be circumcised, that would kind of take the air out of the good news, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, it well. would have given them much more work to do trying to get new converts where they didn't really need to do it. They had a big enough job as it yeah. was. That's no easy matter. I mean, yeah. for full-grown people to be circumcised, yeah. man, that's a, that's a big Okay. Thing. So let's, let's bring this down to our day. How, how might this apply in our day? Christianity is generally recognized as a religion that is supposed to promote love, right? We've been talking about love. Mm -hmm. Are we doing that? We have in our world today a new pope, Pope Francis. He's trying very hard to promote love. Notice these words from an article concerning his beliefs. Now this is a Protestant writing about the Catholic belief, and he's trying to represent as, as, as the best he can the Pope's belief. His beliefs appear, do not appear to be very consistent at all, this author says. He just seems to have an overwhelming desire to unite with everyone out there that has any kind of religious faith. In other words, what, he, what is the Pope really wanting everybody to do? Unite. Together. To join him. Join him yes. But we do know of one kind of people that he does not like. He does not like ideological Christians that take their faith very seriously. Where's the problem here? Likes people that do don't we, think. Do we, chase, do we take our faith seriously? Do we think our beliefs make a difference? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. It goes on, in ideologies there is not Jesus. This is Pope's talking. In ideologies there is not Jesus in his tenderness, his love, his meekness. And ideologies are rigid always, of every sign, rigid. And when a Christian becomes a disciple of the ideology, he has lost, his, he has lost the faith. He is no longer a disciple of Jesus. He is a disciple of this attitude of thought. For this reason, Jesus said to them, you have taken away the key of knowledge. Where's that found? But the key of knowledge is it's the... not in the Bible. No. Oh, interesting. The knowledge of Jesus is transformed into an ideological and, al and also moralistic knowledge because these close the door with many requirements. The faith becomes ideology and ideology, ideology frightens. Ideology chases away the people, distances, distances the people and distances of the church of the people. But it is a serious illness, this of ideological Christians. It is an illness, but it's not new, eh? So what is going to come of all this? And here is the conclusion that this writer says. It will be very interesting to watch. It is also interesting to note that there is a 900-year-old prophecy that seems to indicate that Pope Francis could be the last pope. If that prophecy, prophecy is accurate, then we could very well be living at a time when we will see the emergence of a one-world religion. Just a few short decades ago, a one-world religion would have been absolutely unthinkable. But now, the pieces are starting to come together, and it will be very interesting to see what happens next. Can you define an ideological Christian. An ideological Christian is someone who believes that his, his, who thinks that his beliefs are important. Who follows the words of Jesus. Okay. If they are the words of Jesus, yes. Okay. Yeah. And Seventh-day Adventists would be on the far out stream of this as far as the Pope is concerned. We don't worship on his day. We have, we have many beliefs which don't agree with him. And he, what he basically says is, don't you love? 
if you love, we also we should all pull together, right? And we should we should set aside our differences. But we love God's word. Yeah. Well, when when are these differences going <coughs> to manifest, though? If if Already what this started. author says is true, and um, and you know the differences start manifesting, what's what's going to cause that? It's already started. You've only got to watch what the federal government's doing here and there already. Yeah. Well, what's going to cause it, though? Ignorance. Well, some, large matter. some people yeah. are going to say, we need to all pull together. You don't want to pull together? Then you're the problem. Well, that doesn't <clears throat> sound like pulling people together to me. Oh, yeah, it does. If you're not part of our group, then you're out. Well, I don't know. I kind of think that this that you're more or less describing the spirit of Satan more than anybody else. Yes, that's right. Well, what about it? Is it more important for us to love our fellow Christians and compromise with them? Or is it more important to follow our beliefs, what we believe are the teachings of the Bible? Are these two ideas in conflict? Are we prepared to compromise with the Catholic Church? I don't need to mention them specifically, but... Did Jesus compromise? Doesn't seem like it, does it? Some want to see the Ten Commandments as a long list of don'ts. We are not supposed to do anything wrong, right? If you don't do anything wrong, does that make you a faithful Christian? We should note, and not very far from here where we're sitting tonight, there's a whole community of people right here in Loma Linda who never do anything wrong. Would you consider such people saints? Most people would, right? They don't do anything wrong. They're saints, right? They're buried in the ground at the cemetery. Ain't much a <laughs> they, they don't do anything wrong. But there's more to being a friend of God and a true follower of the gospel than just not doing anything wrong. When our Christian friends think that they need to get rid of the law, what are they really trying to get rid of? God. They're trying to get rid of the Sabbath. They're trying to get rid of God's directions for their lives. We are living in very exciting times. Do we understand the scriptures well enough to correctly represent our God? Do we know how to answer when one of our Catholic friends comes and put our, puts their arm around us and says, Brother, why, why can't we just love one another? Are you supposed to say, well, no, we don't believe in love? That doesn't make sense, does it? So how are we going to respond to people who say, come on, let's all just, just come together. Let's all agree. Doesn't that sound like a good idea? You think about it. We'll see you again next week. Thanks for listening.